like a river through the nations And he's coming to a town near you And he is flowing, outpouring Like a dam that's gonna break through Water flowing in the desert, in the dry land In the valley of the shadow God is singing over dry bones, over dead hearts And everything will live So can we just welcome John? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Let's just extend your hand toward him right now and say, Lord, we just bless uh, your word that is in John. And it's not just word from the scriptures, but it's word that's that has been bouncing around inside of him as he's meditated and pondered and and pursued and and obeyed uh to to gain fresh understanding and we just call that out we just pull that out of him we receive in advance lord uh the word that that you want to give to us and and we are ready to respond to you holy spirit in jesus name amen All right, you ready? Do you have a Bible? You might want it. We're going to be uh, doing some reading. I have so many things I want to share today, and I've got to pick which ones are going to happen, which ones aren't. I want to talk to you this morning about spiritual maturity and solid food. And how I have learned a lot about that from my kids. And how I've learned a lot about my similarity to my kids. <laughs> There's two, two tendencies I, I think we have as followers of Jesus when it comes to spiritual maturity. One is being completely unaware that we need to be more mature. And the other one is thinking that we are a lot more mature than we actually are. And so I I want us to to look at a few things. The first one I want us to look at is John chapter 3. Every anointed message needs to start in the book of John. (laughs) Because that's where the most revelation is. You can also find some pretty good stuff in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Revelation is all right, too. <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, and Luke also talk about John, and um, those are the good parts. John chapter 3, we have a really familiar passage. I'm going to start with verse 1. It says, there was... A man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How many of you have heard this passage before? This is a basic foundational piece of what it means to be a Christian is that you've had an experience with God where you've been born again. And something that we often don't think about with that is that when you are born again, you are born again as a spiritual baby, right? When babies are born, they're not full size. And all the moms said, thank God. (laughs) They they come out pretty tiny, and they come out pretty helpless, and they have a long way to go, right? I have five kids now, five boys, and uh, they all came out small, and they're all growing like weeds. But when you are born again, you are not automatically at the place where God intends for you to be. And unfortunately, in, in Western Christianity and American church, 
we don't put very much emphasis on anything besides making sure people are born again. It, it is the greatest objective for many churches, many ministries, is let's just get people born again. And what happens is people come to a faith in Jesus, and then we leave them there like orphans that never grow up. And as a result, many of them are easy targets for Satan. Many of them don't end up walking with Jesus long term. And Jesus t- talked about that in the par- parable of the sower. He said, there's seed that's scattered and, and, and there are hearts that receive the word of God with gladness. But pretty soon they're scorched by the sun or, or maybe the birds come and eat up the good thing that was given. And God's intention for us is more than just us being born again. The start is that we would be born again, but God has a higher intention for us. I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start with verse 11. It says, It was he, Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Everybody say mature. (laughs) Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ then we will no longer be infants. Everybody say infants. Infants. Tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up. Say "Grow grow up. Into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So this passage, Paul is laying out this revelation for believers and saying, God's will for you, God's dream, is not just to have a bunch of spiritual babies. But his dream is that we would actually grow up and we would grow together to be the body of Christ. We would grow up and that we would be mature. And and there's a theme in the book of Ephesians where he talks about the full measure of God, the full measure of who Jesus is. I think Jesus is pretty spiritually mature. (laughs) And I think that a lot of us don't match that yet. Would you agree? God's desire for us, his dream, and what he is doing right now, what he is working on in our lives, is that we would grow up and become mature. And we know we're there when we are just like Jesus. You know, it's, it's interesting. I was just doing a little... Little uh, study quickly last night. I think it was like 10 p.m. in the church kitchen. My dad was like, do you want to speak tomorrow? <laughs> or do you want to speak? And we decided today would be the day. But I, I would just did a quick study on this word mature that we read. And it's interesting. This is the same word that Jesus used when he says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So when we talk about how mature will you be, it's like, well, when you're like him, that's, that's when you're there. When you're mature at that level, when you are like him, be mature as your father in heaven is mature. Be perfect as he's perfect. A lot of times we, we settle for less because we feel like we're doing pretty good compared to other believers we know. But there is so much more He wants us to grow to be like Jesus. 
I'll throw something else at you as we get rolling here. Revelation chapter 12. This is a passage that uh, a lot of theologians have argued over. Verse 1, it says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. How many of you read that one before? I've been like, ah, <laughs> what's this? And I've heard, I've heard heated arguments about this. But let me tell you something really basic you can get out of it. Without going into all the nitty gritty of the end times, you can see the enemy's preferred tactic is to take out what God is birthing when it's in infant stage. That's just how he operates. If I can take them out while they're infants, then it will never develop into what it was supposed to be. He hasn't changed much. The same tactic goes all the way back to, remember, remember Moses. The people of Israel are in Egypt and they're crying out for a deliverer. They're crying out to God, save us. And God is about to send them a deliverer. So what's, what's the tactic of the enemy? Let's get rid of all the baby boys this age and under. Because if we can get rid of all them, then there is no deliverance. There is no salvation plan of God. It's always been his tactic to do it, it this way. In the New Testament, the world is in utter darkness, crying out for an open heaven. And God sends his best deliverer, Jesus. And what does the enemy do? All the baby boys. Let's kill all the baby boys. This age and under. And it's an attempt to kill off what God intends to grow up so that it can't grow up. Right? Because when it grows up, it will be anointed, powerful, an expression of God on the earth to save people. And so that's, that's just what the enemy does. That also, by the way, is why pro-life issues are so critical. You need to know that abortion is not a political issue. It is entirely spiritual. That the enemy knows that we're in a season where deliverance is supposed to come from God. And so he's released an agenda in the earth to kill off a generation of deliverers. That is why it matters. Statistically speaking, there are at least 20% of, uh, there, are at least, there should be at least 20% more people in this room right now but they aren't alive. What if deliverers that we're looking for, revivalists that we're looking for, weren't even born? The enemy's always after those type of things. And when people are born again into the kingdom of God, Satan knows that the best thing he can do is make sure they never grow up. Make sure they stay babies. So he's all about us continuing to be immature, continuing to stay weak and never growing up. First tactic is try to make sure that you never hear the gospel. If you have heard the gospel, then the next agenda is make sure they can't grow. We all on the same page? Yeah, we're good. So how do you grow? You need to eat. It's important. It's really important. Peter said, crave pure spiritual milk. I 
like infants. He understood you got to start somewhere. You need to grow. And so he was giving this instruction like you need to be fed something. Scripture makes it very clear that we do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what we consume is going to determine, going to determine how we grow. And everybody needs to begin with basic things in the kingdom, basic understanding if they're going to make it. And it's, and it's important that they have the basics. You can't just give a baby a hunk of steak be like, I hope you enjoy this as much as I do, <laughs> right? They're not ready for it. You might kill them. <laughs> you got to start with where they're at. And then gradually you start mixing some hunks into things. You start graduating up to solid food, right? So here's, here's something that I have experienced most days since I became a dad. My kids come running into the house. Dad, we're so hungry. Can we have something to eat? Like they're going to die, you know. And uh, of course, I'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just a few minutes, I'll make lunch. And so I'll get to work making lunch because I love them. I want to feed their bodies. I want them to have full bellies, be happy. I'll make them lunch. And then almost like clockwork, put the plates out. I hate this. <laughs> this is gross. We had this yesterday. Why do we always have to eat this? Right? And usually what they're protesting, most of them, is protein. Some source of protein is always the problem. <laughs> They don't want that. Sometimes it's vegetables, but they, they don't want the protein. And, uh, and so we have a little conversation. <laughs> and we work on their attitudes. We work on gratefulness. And, and the thing is, because I love them, I'm feeding them not just what they want right now. I'm feeding them what they need. Because I, in my love for them, I have a vision for them as men. I have a vision for them as mighty men who will lead in their generation, who will be providers and protectors. I have a vision of them being full stature, strong. And so I'm feeding them the things that lead to that, right? Now, uh, so, so what usually my response ends up being something along these lines. Stay in your seat and eat what's on your plate. <laughs> right? Every day. I'm so hungry. I hate this. Stay in your seat and eat what's on your plate. It's back and forth. And, and here's, here's what I've learned is that you don't grow from eating protein one time. Right? You need to eat protein a lot if you want to grow. You need to eat healthy, a healthy, balanced diet for the long haul if you want to grow every day. And that means there's a lot of repeat, right? So at home, uh, we're, we're not serving up what they had yesterday because we just are lazy. We're serving it up because that was what they needed yesterday, and they need it again today. And so we have this kind of rotating menu at our house of like, we eat these type of things that are healthy, and we want them to grow. And they get tired of the same, the same, the same. But we know this is what they need. What they would prefer is, what is new? What comes out of a shiny package? And what is sweet? They always prefer that over what they actually need. We don't live in town anymore, but we used to live in a neighborhood. And when we lived in that neighborhood, we had neighbors. Uh, one of our neighbors is actually part of our church, Frank Kaczewski. And um, lots of families in the neighborhood. And my kids would love to eat anywhere but my house. <laughs> 
because they realize the neighbors and our friends and Frank love them also, right? But it's different. They go to, they go to the neighbor's house. You know, there's some other family. And, uh, and it's completely embarrassing to Unisha and I. They're like, we are so hungry. Do you have anything to eat? <laughs> like, we starve them all week. <laughs> Do you have anything to eat? And those people are like, oh, yeah, you know, like, we just baked some cookies, you know, like, <laughs> or we just bought Oreos or, you know, whatever. And, and our kids are like, yes, this is awesome. They'll load up at the neighbor's house. And our neighbors love them. Our friends love them, but only to the degree of like, I want to make you smile right now. But they have no commitment or vision for who they're going to be in 20 years from now. Like, are they going to struggle with cancer because they had a poor diet their whole life? Are they, you know, they aren't thinking those things. I am. And it it could appear that Frank loves my kids more than I do. (laughs) To the point they go out to the back fence. There's like, Frank, Frank, (laughs) do you have cake? (laughs) (laughs) Screaming across the fence for cake. (laughs) Is it time for snack yet? You know, <laughs> there's a difference, and I know that they need to eat these healthy things more. Sure, there's a time and a place for the treats and all those those new things. I want to expose them to those as well, but I know that they will become whatever they eat the most of. Right? You talk to any bodybuilder, and they're like, "You got to get your protein in. If you want to be ripped." <laughs> So I need to feed them something often enough until it becomes part of them, literally, right? And often they reject it because we already had that yesterday. And I found that I do the same thing spiritually. When there is a word that is coming out, a word from God, I often object to it if I've already heard it. If I've already heard it a lot, I feel like I don't I don't want to hear this again. Not realizing that probably the intention of God is that I need to hear it many, many, many more times until it becomes part of who I am. Does that make sense? And so I I've been learning from my kids that I need to and we need to as believers stay in our seat and eat what's on our plate. Left to themselves, my kids never stay at their plate. They'll get distracted by, you know, looking at something exciting out the window or they will go find Frank and his Oreos (laughs) or whatever and they will not get what they need because they're distracted or they get filled up somewhere else with something that isn't adequate. So they need to stay in their seat. They need to be where they are supposed to be with the food that was given to them by someone who's committed to them in their long-term health, right? Um, you know, and I won't lie, it's, it's a pain to feed them. I don't like giving the same thing because I know the reaction I'm going to get. I don't like arguing like, you need to eat this. It's healthy for you. I don't like that. I would rather just be like, go find Frank, you know, (laughs) please. (laughs) Just. (laughs) But what I know for them is that they need to be with with the food that I gave them because I know their lives. I have a calling from God to watch over them and help them become what they're supposed to be. Our neighbors aren't. They're just, you know. And and here's the thing is like our neighbors, there's a lot of very nice families. But it's not my kid's family, right? They're taking care of their kids. I'm taking care of my kids. Sure, go visit. But you belong most of the time at our house with the food we're giving you. Does that make sense? Stay in your seat and and eat what's on your plate. 
often they don't want to eat with a couple of them. They're not all the same. We got we got one one boy who will like eat the house if we let him. But um, most of the rest of them would just like have a few nibbles. And then go outside and have an absolute, you know, crash of like whininess and all this stuff. It's because they are literally starving and haven't eaten. So we're trying to tell them like, yes, you need this. You need more of this. You need to eat at least two more bites. Some of you who are parents know this. And those of you who had parents, remember this. Right? You need at least two more bites of this. Because we want to make sure that they're filled with what they need. So what I found for us as believers is that we often are the same, that when there's something that we actually need, we can end up rejecting it and prefer whatever comes in a shiny package, whatever is new, whatever is a novel thing, um, whatever comes from a different house than our own, and, um, and whatever's sweet. Right? And that's not necessarily what we need to grow. In our culture, we enable it quite a bit. You know, in the, in the early church, when you got saved, you went to the church that was there. In our nation, we have the luxury of like, if you don't like this church, there's literally one across the parking lot. You can just go there and have something else. And I, I'm sure they're teaching the word of God. Bless them. But the issue is we tend to go to the new, the shiny, the something else, somewhere else, and not stay in our seat long enough to get what we need. And to be fed by people who, have, who know, like, what have you eaten before this? I don't mind if my kids have an Oreo if everything they had before this was good for them. But I know when all they've had is like an Oreo at their house and a brownie at their house and, <laughs> you know, and it's just a little bit, just a little bit here and there, but it's not what they need. And, and they can get full of things that actually are going to shipwreck their life later. And when they get to a certain stage in their life, they will be sick instead of strong. Or they will be weaklings instead of healthy. And that's, that's not the vision I have. God doesn't have that vision for us either. He wants us to, to be fed things that are good for us. All right. That wasn't too bad, was it? There's a scripture in the New Testament that says, it's no trouble for me to write these things to you again. I think that some of the most important things that God wants to speak to us are things that we need to hear again and again and again. And I think it's good for us to look into our own hearts and see, am I having a protesting, whiny, bad attitude because I'm hearing the same thing again? You know, for, again, I brought this up. It's not enough to grow strong to eat protein once. You go and eat protein, and then life happens. And then you need it again so that you can keep moving on with life. And there are truths of the kingdom that many of us would consider basic. But you know what? We need them more often than we think. I remember going to a conference where there was a speaker that I didn't like very much. I didn't think he was all that great. And he taught a lot of things that I didn't really agree with. (laughs) Um, And there were a lot of things that I just felt like... 
I know as much as this guy. <laughs> and I felt the Holy Spirit just challenge me. He's like, you think you know it? Could you teach it without notes? Kind of put me in my seat. <laughs> Realized like, no, I just have a bad attitude because I've heard this taught before. But God was correcting me and showing me like, but you don't know it, know it. And you don't even live it. You just don't want to hear somebody talk about that subject again. And so that became a goal for me when I would listen to people teaching is like, could I walk out the door and mingle with people for 30 minutes and even remember what I was taught? Or is it gone? Could I take this and represent it to somebody in a way that would change their life? And most of the time, the answer is no. So I made it my goal that when I listen, I would listen with the intent of, even if I feel like I already know this, I need it again, and I probably don't know it nearly as well as I should. There are basic things that we need to hear again and again. And there are things that if you're, in a, if you're in a church family, probably that your pastor knows you need to hear more times than you think. There's, there's a lot of different statistics that have been offered about this idea. But somewhere between, it takes between, somewhere between seven and eight times of a pastor teaching on a topic before people will consider doing something about it. On average. So when you have a pastor that's looking at his flock and where it needs to go, and he gives a message and he sees no no lives transition at all, guess what he's going to do? We're going to feed this same meal again. (laughs) Those little arms are still toothpicks. You need more protein. You need some. (laughs) We need to build you up. We need to give you strength. So there are things that we need to hear more often than we think. Okay? Uh, Let's let's look at Hebrews chapter 5 real quick. I'm struggling because each one of these topics, there's a bunch of things I could say, and I'm trying to move on. Hebrews 5, verse 11. The writer of Hebrews says, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. What a kind and encouraging (laughs) thing. Make you feel like you're living your best life. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. Okay? So the writer of Hebrews is offering a rebuke to them. And The nature of it is this, like there's nothing wrong with being a baby unless you're still acting like one when you're 14, right? (laughs) Babies are cute. Babies are wonderful. Big babies are not. (laughs) And he's saying "There, there is something that's supposed to have happened in you that you would go from being an infant to being mature. In fact, you should be a teacher by now instead of needing teaching. Again, in Western Christianity, we just have this emphasis on get people born again. 
we don't have very much of an emphasis on freely you received, get ready to freely give. Whatever God has given to you, somebody else probably needs that really badly. So he says, You ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you. I have heard many times over the years people complain like, I'm just not getting fed at that church. I'm just not getting fed. I'm not getting fed. It's very spiritual. When you say things like that, you are a self-proclaimed big baby. I expect that it is someone else's job to put the spoon in my mouth. And tell me how to know God, how to, how to walk in his ways. There is a time every single one of us needs that. And the wise should always be ready to learn from the wise and to add to their learning, right? We should always be ready to listen. But putting the expectation on is somebody else's job for me to have a connection with God is to deny why Jesus came in the first place so that there would no longer need to be a mediator, right? That you could have your own relationship with the Father, that you could hear his voice. He says, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. And at this point, he's offering that as a rebuke. When Peter talked about it, he said, this is what you need. You need milk. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, but not anymore. (laughs) It's time to eat. I don't know if any of you have had kids like that. that They they just want to drink. They don't want to (laughs) eat. And, you know, they might get some calories in, but they're not going to get muscles. And so he starts throwing out some things to say, like, you know, if you want to be mature, you're going to need to know a lot about righteousness. That's a good, that's a good heart check for us all. Like, what do I know about righteousness? Could you tell someone what righteousness is if they asked you, what is righteousness? Do you know? How do you live in righteousness? How does that still matter if God forgives all your sins? But he's saying that's an elementary truth. And he and then he goes on in chapter six and he starts listing off elementary teachings. He says, these are the elementary, these are like the basic basics. Repentance from acts that lead to death. That's a basic, basic. Faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Another great heart check. How much do you know about each one of those things? How much do you know about the resurrection of the dead? How much do you know about eternal judgment? How much do you know about the laying on of hands? Well, you know. (laughs) We do it. My church, we do it, you know. He's saying these are the basics. Have you ever heard a message about those things? Like, let's just cover the basics today. So what about the, like, the real stuff God wants to get us to? I think some of the things that we think are basics are even less than basic. Maybe they're just junk food that a neighbor is offering us. Let's, let's go back over to Ephesians 4. If you guys listen faster, I'll be done faster. Stay in your seat and eat what's on your plate. (laughs) All right, 
Ephesians 4, verse 14, he says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Okay, so here's the reality. There is teaching that is released, winds of teaching that are released that blow people around. And if you're a spiritual lightweight, you'll go with every new blast of wind. And it talks about that there are people that are teaching, and, and you know, there, there are misguided teachers, and then there are teachers who actually don't care about you at all. They might actually be looking at you as a source of profit for themselves. Being a motivational speaker is a good gig. Selling books, selling e-courses, selling webinars. It's big money. Those are winds of teaching. And if you are not grounded, if you're not staying in your seat, you're going to be blowing to whichever house has the waft of cookies coming out of it. <laughs> And, and you will find yourself just being tossed back and forth and never growing. There, there is teaching that you can go get that it's just another wind. And yes, you're being taught something you didn't know, but it might not be what you need. Right? There are whole churches that their focus is like, we're just going to help you have a good life. You know? Every Sunday you can hear about how to, how to have a better marriage or how to parent your kids better or whatever. And it's all about how to make this life happen a little bit more smoothly. They're offering smoothies. They're offering smoothies. <laughs> Smooth living. Look at that. But the long-term thing is like, how's your eternity? How about... If you're facing persecution, how about when things really get rough, you know? So there's, there's teaching you can follow this that's based on somebody else's desire to profit off of you. And I've, I've had the chance to be a part of the conference circuit a little bit with worship stuff and get to rub shoulders with some of the who's who and the big name speakers and one of the things that was, uh, I remember just a shocking experience for me was hanging out with this one very well-known speaker. And he would always teach this certain set of subjects. And then um, eventually he switched to like this almost new age stuff. Really way, way, way out there stuff. And everybody was just so shocked. But what it revealed was that his heart wasn't for, let's grow up the people of God and give them the truth over and over again. It was about, my conferences aren't selling anymore. But this book is new and sensational and people will buy it. And the content of that book, very interesting, but it will not change your life or make you spiritually strong. You just know stuff about stuff, but you don't know God. And you don't know how to walk in his ways. Does that make sense? And so, like, that's, that's out there way more than we know. Just winds of teaching and people trying to come up with, how do I stay on the conference circuit? How do I grow my YouTube channel? How do I keep people engaged? You know? If you're following teachers on social media, be really careful. Because here's, here's the behind the scenes reality. They know the algorithm is the God of social media. And if they don't keep putting out content that is sensational and gets likes and shares, the algorithm will shut them down. You'll never see them again. But if they can put out sensational things that people will like and share, they will stay visible to the rest of us. And so there's pressure all the time 
that you need to be putting out content that people will engage with, right? And what will people engage with? Whatever's flashy and sweet. Nobody wants to hear the hard stuff when they're scrolling through social media. You know, I'm, they're there for a good time. They're there to take a break, to cure their boredom. And so if, if your spiritual diet is coming a lot from social media platforms, I guarantee you that you're not getting all the meat that you need. You are getting probably an overdose of the sweet and the fluff because they have to do that to even keep their accounts working. Right? I know this from... from my side of social media, social media with music stuff, all the things they tell me I need to do to make sure that I stay in people's faces and I'm relevant and I don't get buried by the algorithm. It's disgusting. Some of it's good. Some of it's fine. But they're, they, and here's what they always tell you. They say, look what people liked the most, what they engage with the most, and then give them lots more of that. So it's not driven even by the, the teachers and the pastors and the leaders teaching what they know people need. They're instructed like, find out what the people like and give lots more of that. And what do babies like? Not the healthy stuff, right? So that's just how it works. And we need to, we need to be careful, okay? All right. 10 more minutes. We're going to get you out of here, all right? I want to also just talk about the reality that there are levels of maturity. You don't go from infant to full grown, just like Jesus, with one decision, right? You grow over time. I want to throw this thought at you. I think a lot of people assume like you're a spiritual baby and you have milk and then boom, full grown man, I eat meat. Let me tell you something. My five-year-old eats meat. Not willingly, always. <laughs> My 10-year-old gobbles meat. The fact that you can handle some more stuff doesn't mean you've arrived. You might still be a kid. Does that make sense? Just because you can handle a little bit more deeper teaching does not mean that you are where God intends for you to be in your spiritual maturity. Just because you can look down on somebody else's spiritual diet doesn't mean that you're doing so great. There are levels of spiritual maturity and moving on to solid food and moving on to meat is the beginning of then growing to becoming the full man like Jesus. An infant has to be fed milk. A child can eat meat. A teen can feed themselves. That's another level of maturity that we need to be aiming for is not just, can I handle it? But can I feed myself? I don't need to go find somebody to tell me how to sprinkle the cheese on a tortilla and push 60 seconds on the microwave. <laughs> I can do it myself. <laughs> you learn to start feeding yourself. That's, that's another level of spiritual maturity that I hope you're aiming for, is that your relationship with God isn't just Sunday morning or a weeknight Bible study or something, but that you and God have something going on right? Again, the wise always add to their learning. It doesn't mean you don't, like, I will not eat anything anybody else serves. <laughs> but you know how to provide for yourself when you're hungry. I don't always have to wait for mom to do it. I don't always have to wait for dad to do it. I can feed myself something. That's, that's King David at his lowest encouraged himself in the Lord. He knew how to feed himself when there's nobody there to prop him up. But again, that, that is not as far as it goes. It's a teen level. An infant has to be fed milk. A child can eat meat. A teen can feed themselves. 
a young adult buys their own food and feeds themselves. <laughs> That's a different level, right? My kids are crossing into that ready to be a teen phase, you know, and they, they can make their own food. <laughs> Not at all cognizant of the fact that, like, I just shelled out $600 at Costco so that they would have that shredded cheese <laughs> to put in the microwave. But they take initiative of not only do I know how to make food for myself, I'm going to go buy it for myself. I'm going to start managing myself so that I can get food. And maybe you start having thoughts of like, you know, I can cook some pretty good stuff. I can not only make a quesadilla, but I can make something that is balanced and healthy it's a young adult level. Here, here's, here's another level, though. Another level is when you take the responsibility of feeding someone else. That's, that's, that's a level where your spiritual maturity goes to a different place when you realize it's not just about do I know how to feed myself and do I, can I take solid food, but can I feed somebody else? That's a different level of maturity. And it's a different level of maturity to know how to do it and to take the responsibility of I will do this for somebody else. This baby won't make it if I don't feed it. It's another level of spiritual maturity when you don't just do it when you're on schedule to help in the nursery. But you say, this is my baby. I take full responsibility to see this baby through to, to be what I am. Does that make sense? And I feed them before I feed myself. That's, that's, a, different, that's a different level. I think we're, we're all grateful that when we come here on, on Sundays or whatever, we never have to wonder if Pastor Paul and Margie are walking with God. We're grateful that they are taking care of that. <laughs> they maintain their relationship with God. They feed, they feed their relationship with God. And we're grateful that no matter what they are going through personally, they take care of us. You know, we don't, we don't ask them, you know, like, man, has it been a rough week? Are you going to be able to teach today? It's just like, you're mature. Do your thing. <laughs> give, us the, give us the bread. <laughs> We're grateful for people like that. And it's because that's a level of maturity where, where you come to a place of like, I know how to feed myself, but I also, I'm going to make sure that you are fed before I am. That's how, that's how it is parenting. Like, you don't get fresh food anymore. <laughs> you don't get hot food ever. <laughs> Your ice cream will be melted since yesterday. <laughs> because you fed your kids first what they needed. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to make a burrito with chicken nuggets. Because <laughs> you already gave them the good stuff. And all that's left is some frozen chicken nuggets in the freezer that have been there for a year and a half. And you're like, oh, oh, Lord. <laughs> but you're okay with it. Because you are concerned not with me, 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 me. You're concerned with, how are they doing? How are they doing? Are they getting what they need? I was talking with my friend David a while back, and we were commiserating. He was telling me, I had no idea how much of my life would be spent <laughs> focusing on food. <laughs> preparing food, serving food, and waiting for that food to be finished. <laughs> you know, one meal is like four hours, and then by the time you finish that, they're like, we're hungry. <laughs> you know, it's, like <laughs> it's just like an all-day thing, feeding others. And so that's part, of, 
that's part of how you know you've arrived in a place of spiritual maturity is that that's what you do. And you rejoice in it. Like, this is who I am. I feed people. And at this stage of maturity, you realize, because there's, there's definitely a thing that happens where you're like, ah, this is awful. <laughs> I do not want to be doing this. He's ungrateful little, you know. And then it dawns on you. Somebody did this for me. <laughs> you know, it probably took me till I was like 27 <laughs> to actually understand <laughs> the difference between when my mom said she loved me and I said I love her back. <laughs> my mom was like, I would do anything for you. I'd die for you. And I was like, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Warm thoughts. <laughs> yeah. You know what's not spiritual maturity? Is when you criticize how other people cook. It feels very mature when you can find a word someone else brings and criticize it. You know, of like, we've heard this before, or, you know, you said that, you said Joseph, and you were supposed to say James. <laughs> Paul didn't write that, Peter did. <laughs> It's in Proverbs, not Psalms. I listen to a guy on YouTube who knows Greek better than you. And you're wrong. It can feel very spiritual, like you've arrived at a place of maturity when you can analyze teaching or something that a leader gets wrong. And, and it, it essentially is like if one of my kids is like, Dad, you burned the eggs. Like, let me tell you something. <laughs> I shopped for the eggs. I bought the eggs. I cooked the eggs. And right when they're about to be done, your little brother decided to explode diarrhea out. His <laughs> and I am well aware that the eggs are burned. <laughs> and it wasn't your brilliance that brought that to my attention. <laughs> I know how to cook this better, you know? It's like, sure, but can you cook everything every day, all the time, <laughs> for all the siblings? <laughs> it's not spiritual maturity to criticize. There's a lot of that. This is just a side note also. One of the best things you can do for yourself right now, if you're on social media, is do not listen to people who criticize other ministries. It's poison. It's so toxic. It will not, it will not help you. It is, it is the exact opposite of what Jesus is calling for, for us to unify and for us to humble ourselves. It is self-exalting to say, I see what's wrong with you. And because you have something wrong with you, I don't have to unify with you. And it's, it's exactly what Satan is after. Let's, let's magnify our offenses and our differences instead of let's find the place where we have unity in Jesus, the place where we connect. Yeah, you're a hand, I'm an ear, but somewhere we connect, and we need to focus on that. Yeah, so those are some thoughts. And because you listen so well, I probably shouldn't keep going. Um, <laughs> God would love for us to grow up. He would love for us to become mature. Our, our issues are usually that we don't know that we need to grow up or that we think that, that we are more mature than we are. And I'm sure there's some of you who just listen to this message and like, <laughs> there's like seven more levels, John. You're only 38. <laughs> You know, like, probably. <laughs> There's probably more to come that I have no clue about. Yeah. Grow 
going back down. <laughs> so my, my encouragement to you is to just examine your heart. How am I doing with all that? Am I honestly acting like a baby? Am I a baby? If you're a baby, you just came to know the Lord, you're great. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but am I a big baby? <laughs> am I a hotshot teen who can tell mom that she burned the eggs? Am I a young adult in my spiritual maturity that I think I'm so mature, but I don't actually take responsibility for anybody else? Have I ever thanked somebody for feeding me? <laughs> yeah. Am I taking any responsibility to learn how to encourage myself in the Lord? Am I somebody who's trying to add to my wisdom and keep learning no matter what? And maybe a, maybe a big thing is to examine like, how often am I rejecting the food that I was given and chasing something shinier, sweeter somewhere else? So Lord, we, we just thank you that we are born again. Thank you for spiritual life, Lord. Lord, I pray that that we would not be ones that the dragon gets to eat because he found us while we were still babies. Lord, we pray that we will not be the infants that are tossed back and forth by every wind of teaching and other people's agendas. Lord, I pray that you help us to to know where's my family? Where's my seat that I'm supposed to be sitting in? Lord, I pray that you help us to recognize even things that we've been avoiding eating that are the reason that we haven't grown and the reason that we don't have what we said we wanted to have. Lord, I pray that you help us to realize that maybe there's some people that we're avoiding because we don't like that they keep telling us to eat the same thing, but they actually love us so much and want to see us grow. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you will show us how we can step it up and say, you know what? I have freely received. I want to freely give this to somebody else. I want to, I want to be someone who can teach. I want to be someone who can, who can feed the next generation of believers. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just say yes to growing up. Yes to maturity. Lord, I pray that you give us a vision that's way bigger than what we've had, that we would realize you're calling us to grow up all the way like Jesus. Not even just like some pastor or leader, but like Jesus. Help us to keep growing, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen.